Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. These are the only Italian words you will hear in this conference, which will be all in English. Uh, and we are very happy that we have very distinguished colleagues here uh, from our uh, Italian partner universities, but also much beyond from, uh, let's say, all parts, all corners of the, of the world, in order to discuss uh, the topic of our international workshop, which is the judiciary in territorial and culturally compound systems, organization, and functions. And as this workshop is part of a larger research project before plunging into the first uh, panel on uh, indigenous peoples issues, I'd like to introduce very, very briefly uh, some main features of our research project, uh, which is represented here by this uh, piece of art. Uh, the point is that uh, the research project is a very, um, has a very challenging task to uh, look into and to analyze more profoundly the relations between uh, pluralisms of different kinds and uh, jurisdiction and especially the principles of unity and uniformity of jurisdiction uh, which are affected and challenged by different kinds of, um, ju um, by different kinds of pluralisms. And uh, exactly this is what is uh, supposed to be also uh, shown here by this piece of art um, which is the symbol of, uh, of our uh, project and also to be found on the, on the website, <clears throat> uh, which shows these plural foundations on the, on the top left, uh, symbolized by these uh, circles, uh, which shall um, in a way symbolize, as I said, the contemporary legal orders of the Western legal tradition, which experience this uh, process of consolidation and development of different kinds of pluralism, which uh, we have listed. We have tried to uh, agree upon a group uh, of categories, which you can see uh, on the listed on the right. And then in the middle, you have this plain area here, uh, which is actually uh, symbolizing the principles of unity and uniformity of the jurisdiction. Um, and in particular, the questions of organization of the judiciary, the role of highest courts, and the consistency of rules affected by pluralism uh, are the main interest of our research. And this is practically to force our way through this middle ground and end up in that area, um, which um, shall then, um, in a way, express uh, the very hope for a kind of sustainable pluralism uh, at the very end. In order to show you the uh, organizational uh, complications in uh, terms of implementation of um, the project, you can see that this is not an easy endeavor as we have already six different categories and of course there's also overlap uh, within these categories as we will see also in these two days most probably. But also on the right we have eight, uh, we have a team, a uh, network of eight Italian uh, university as research partners <coughs> and uh, uh, we have the ambition not to assign one of the categories to each research partner and to work in parallel, but as we have already experienced uh, more often and the last time yesterday, just before uh, the conference dinner, uh, we have the um, ambition also of integrating our research uh, among the teams, of interacting with the teams, and so this is very, uh, a very good um, tradition already, I would dare to say that also many of the partners are here today from the, uh, representing the different um, research units. Yeah, I think this is what uh, can be said uh, for, the, for the project. And without further ado, I want to uh, introduce the, the first panel. So um, the conference actually um, is about <coughs> Territorially and culturally compound system. We will uh, start with the latter one, uh, with the latter ones, yeah, uh, which is the question of judicial autonomy of indigenous peoples, uh, and then in the afternoon deal with the territorially compound systems, looking into the um, judicial functions and organization in uh, some federal systems. This again is part of the wider research design and activities we have already uh, carried out. There have been already. Uh, Roberto, please correct me if I'm wrong, three uh, conferences, workshops on indigenous peoples. I think uh, a larger one which was dedicated to North America and uh, two smaller uh, e uh, events on Latin America. Uh, we had uh, in, in Trento 
Uh, and there has also been a lot of activity already going on regarding the federal systems, uh, among uh, other things, uh, a conference in uh, Turin uh, on India and a conference in Udine uh, on different kinds of federal systems. So uh, the two panels of today are actually complementary and integrating uh, the work which has already been done. And uh, so our uh, plan for the publication of the results is also to put all these things together into uh, one publication. Okay, so this is the frame in which we will uh, discuss, and then tomorrow is another day and we will discuss reflective judiciary, but this is the frame we will discuss, so there's many things, and because there are so many things um, to discuss, and also um, we, uh, we want to take time also for discussion, and this is the reason why we do not have very many speakers, but we have uh, distinguished speakers, and uh, we have um, the ambition of giving the speakers the necessary time to present, which will be roughly half an hour, a generous half an hour. Um, and then afterwards, we will have time for immediately raising and discussing some questions. <coughs> um, and then um, at the end of the half day, we will have additional time in order to wrap up and uh, have some more general cross um, presentation, uh, remarks, comments, and, and question to discuss. So I think this is uh, a difference to uh, conference format. We have called it an international workshop also in order to uh, dedicate time to, to reflect and to use also uh, you who are in the audience in order to contribute to the, um, in order to, contrib to make some uh, contribution also for our uh, research endeavor. So, and uh, after this long introduction, uh, I will now proceed with uh, introducing uh, the panel. I'm very happy that I have to preside actually in both panels over a female composition of the panel. So I'm uh, the, how, uh, in, in to our terms of flu uh, pluralism here and, and gender issues, so I'm the, the quota man, as you, as you say, <laughs> not, not the quota woman, as it is usually uh, the case. And um, after now, I will also limit myself to very few remarks so that this will become even more evident. Uh, so we have um, the pleasure to um, have with us uh, Alexander Xantaki, uh, who is actually um, at the Department of Politics, History and the Brunel Law School uh, in uh, Brunel, London. And she's a minority and indigenous rights expert, <clears throat> has written an important monograph on indigenous rights and United Nations standards, self-determination, culture, and land. And this is actually why, knowing her already from uh, further, uh, from the previous seminar, we have in, uh, invited her in order to tell us something uh, about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which will be the introduction then we have the great pleasure to have a guest, from, a guest speaker from Australia, uh, Judge, uh, Justice Debbie Mortimer, uh, who has a very distinguished career as a uh, barrister in, uh, in Australia and is now uh, a judge at the um, Federal Court uh, in Melbourne. And uh, she has worked a lot uh, in the field of indigenous or aboriginal uh, issues in uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, this is the reason why we I'm very uh, happy to have her here and to hear also something about the, uh, maybe the practical implication of someone working in the judiciary on uh, these issues. Uh, the panel is actually then uh, completed by Claire Charters, whom you have uh, maybe seen already uh, when we did the Skype test, because she is still in New Zealand and will remain in New Zealand, but she will be here uh, discussing and presenting via Skype. I hope that this will be uh, that this will work out uh, very well. Uh, and uh, Claire, <clears throat> Dr. Claire Charters is um, also an expert on indigenous people's rights, international and constitutional law, with a, usually with a comparative uh, focus. And in her uh, PhD thesis, she examined the legitimacy of indigenous people's norms under international law. But she, will, uh, she has also done work for the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for human rights in the indigenous peoples and minority sections. And she will talk about, uh, of course, the judicial autonomy of Aboriginal peoples in New Zealand. So we will uh, organize this panel in a way that we will have the two presentations uh, first, uh, then we have a short coffee break, and afterwards we have Claire Charter's presentation and uh, the discussion. So uh, thank you for uh, 
patiently listening to me. Uh, if there's any uh, other thing, organizational or so, you can, of course, always uh, please ask me or um, Georgia Satori, who is the responsible for uh, the administrative and organizational logistical part. And that is the introductory organizational part. I welcome everyone and hope that we have a, I'm sure that we have a fruitful discussion here uh, in our first panel. Please, Alexander, take the floor. Good morning. Um, let me start by thanking um, Professor Tonati and also um, Professor York for inviting me and um, Ms. Sartori for being so um, patient with me and, and also so um, efficient. Um, it is fantastic to be again in Trento. Uh, when I got the invitation, I kind of silently went, woohoo. So, um, <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, indigenous rights and the judiciary um, in, um, in the um, United Nations Declaration, how the judiciary and judicial matters are treated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And for those of you who maybe are not very familiar with the Declaration, and I know that some of you are very familiar, but for those of you who are not familiar with the Declaration, this is a, a United Nations instrument that was adopted in 2007 after a long period of elaboration, um, more than 20 years. The, um, the UN was discussing and discussing and rediscussing um, some of the issues. And, and it has been um, seen as uh, one of the major successes of the um, United Nations. Um, Richard Falk has said that it has restored the credibility of the United Nations. And this is because it is one of the few um, instruments that have been um, adopted with the actual um, active participation um, leadership um, of the transnational indigenous movement. So, um, so the mechanisms of um, um, adopting the declaration have been very, um, have been different to other instruments. Um, and, and this is reflected um, on the content, in the content of the declaration. It is a far reaching instrument. Um, it recognizes um, um, rights that um, have not been recognized before to subnational um, groups. Um, this includes self-determination, autonomy, um, very extensive land rights, very extensive uh, intellectual property rights and, and heritage rights, um, reparations, uh, restitution, and, um, uh, and, and a number of other um, very far-reaching um, rights. Um, the overriding principle and the heart of the Declaration is Article 3, which um, um, recognizes the right of indigenous peoples to self-determination. And part of the 20 years, the, the, the greatest part of the 20 years, um, passed with uh, discussions on whether this right should be recognized to indigenous groups and also whether this right should be recognized as qualified, so only internal self-determination, autonomy, what we discuss here, or whether it should be recognized as an unqualified right in the same way as um, the right to self-determination is recognized to, quote, all peoples um, in um, Common Article 1 of International Covenants. And finally, there was a, a compromise that was reached. Um, the Article 3 um, follows the language of the International Covenants, and this is to show that indigenous peoples are considered peoples, so nations in international law, and they have all the rights um, that nations have in international law. Um, so it is um, indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, no qualification. But then, um, the spotlight is on internal self-determination, um, uh, on, on auto autonomy and, and other forms of internal self-determination. Um, and you can see that in Article 4. So Article 4 reads, indigenous peoples in exercising their right to self-determination have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. 
And then, um, um, of great interest to us today, is Article 5, which specifically um, focuses on um, legal institutions. So indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions, while retaining their right to participate fully if they so choose in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. And I think that for um, uh, today, for, for the uh, workshop today, this is um, one of the most important um, articles. So you can see that this article um, recognizes, confirms a sort of duality that indigenous peoples have um, in, um, when it comes to their rights. So on the one hand, um, the declaration recognizes that they're part of the wider um, society of the state, so there should be non-discrimination. Um, but on the other hand, so they can um, participate in um, the life of the state without any discrimination. And on the other hand, um, the um, a principle of self-determination is expressed by giving them the right, recognizing the right to them um, to form their own and strengthen their own institutions. So you can see that we have discrimination, non-discrimination, and, and um, self-determination on, on the other hand. Um, and I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the declaration says, if they so choose. So when it comes to minorities, there is all this talk about integration and how important integration is for minorities. And maybe this is the subject of a different conference, whether what we mean by integration and, and whether minorities really should integrate uh, and to what extent. But definitely the declaration recognizes that it's not the same with indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples are treated very differently from minorities, and indigenous peoples, they themselves decide whether to integrate um, um, or not, whether to participate in the wider society, or whether to remain separate. And this is, of course, um, because of the um, historical injustices that indigenous peoples have um, suffered um, uh, from so... Um, the, uh, the obligation to participate um, has been used as a way to assimilate them for um, a long time. Um, this is also because of their distinctiveness. So international law recognizes that they're so distinct that, um, and, and so distinct from the rest of the population that they don't always have to um, go with the mainstream the mainstream, and um, this is also because of the, their historical continuity with um, um, the, that, that they have. Um, so uh, they've been there for a long time. They had the, um, the time to create hierarchies and, and systems, and international law recognizes that these hierarchies and these systems um, um, should continue if indigenous nations choose um, that they want them to continue. And then, so, so also my talk, um, when, when I talk about indigenous peoples and, and uh, justice um, issues, uh, my talk um, will reflect this duality. On the one hand, we have to have non-discrimination, and on the other hand, we have to um, focus a bit more on the separate um, judicial systems and, and customs. And this is the latter, is also reflected in Article 34 of the Declaration. And before I go any further, as all of you know, the Declaration is not, has non-legally -bind, binding force. So it is not like a treaty in international law states do not, um, are, are under no legal obligation to follow it. Having said that, the, the, the legitimacy of this instrument is such um, that um, it has, uh, it, it's been widely argued that is, if you wish, more than a mere declaration. So um, in any case, declarations are soft law, so states are under the political um, obligation to follow it, and that's why states 
um, have agreed to the um, to the principles of the declaration, um, but also um, the way it was um, adopted gives it more legitimacy. And finally, a lot, especially of our North American scholars, argue that um, parts of the declaration now already form um, customer international law. Um, so. Um, if um, a provision is customary international law, then all states are under the obligation to actually follow this provision. So um, Sigrid Wiesner and Anaya have um, said that, for example, have maintained that land rights are um, already customary international law. So irrespective of, you know, whether, irrespective of the fact that we're talking about a declaration, they say that these rights um, uh, must be followed and must become just justiciable uh, at the domestic level. So the same goes with Article 34. It is not legally binding, but it does interpret um, the legally binding um, provisions of international of, of um, the international covenants. Um, and and in this respect, it uh, it it has um, um, some important um, force. So Article 34 um, reads, indigenous peoples have the right to promote, develop, maintain, and maintain their institutional structures and their distinctive customs, spirituality, traditions, procedures, practices, and in the cases where they exist, juridical systems or customs in accordance with international human rights standards. And if I kind of try to interpret this provision, um, so first of all, it is it is a, a, a step forward that we finally um, have a human rights instrument that recognizes that legal pluralism in international law. So we have an international instrument that um, recognizes that there are um, there may be plural um, multiple systems. At the domestic level, and and this must uh, this must um, coincide, um, and um, um, indigenous uh, rights, um, indigenous um, structures should be um, promoted, developed, and maintained. Um, so, in this respect, it is um, the the provision is a, a big success for indigenous peoples themselves but also for um, subnational groups in general. So subnational groups can say, minorities can say, look at the um, indigenous peoples, they have the right to maintain their um, specific systems, um, uh, juridical systems, why can't we? Um, Kim Lika disagrees with me on this. He says that um, although um, Theoretically, this is uh, an option. Minorities and, and other subnational groups really cannot make use of indigenous rights, including this provision, because um, he says they, um, they haven't made use of this so far and they don't have the legitimacy that maybe indigenous peoples have. Okay, I, I still feel that um, the first step has been um, made in international human rights law and it's up to minorities and other subnational groups to push for the recognition of their own um, juridical systems. Um, also, Article 34 is the, um, um, is the um, outcome of the marriage, if you wish, of self-determination and cultural rights. Um, and this is something that um, the um, existing standards on, on international law do not recognize when it comes to minorities. So, for example, the UN Human Rights Committee has said, we're either going to talk about self-determination or we're going to talk about minorities. We can't talk about um, uh, both of them. Whereas here, we are talking about self-determination and um, cultural rights um, uh, together. Um, and. This um, is reflected in the, this reflects the understanding that indigenous self-determination has. So indigenous self-determination is not viewed as related only to political power, um, but it is viewed as a, a wider um, concept 
that, as Dias has said, relates, uh, um, points out to bilateral um, state relations between indigenous and non-indigenous uh, peoples. Originally, the article did not say, um, in the cases where they exist, um, juridical systems or customs. So the article um, included only that, uh, the recognition of institutional structures. Um, and indigenous uh, representatives were pushing for the inclusion of um, laws. As you can see, um, the term laws is not included. So we recognize the juridical um, systems, but we do not recognize the indigenous laws as such. Um, but at the same time, because the, um, the, we had the juridical systems or customs included, states unfortunately manage also to include in the cases where they exist. So a lot of states can say now, of course, and, and many Latin American uh, states have done that in the elaboration of the declaration. Um, of course we accept the uh, legal pluralism uh, when it comes to indigenous systems. And of course we would then um, recognize um, indigenous juridical systems. Unfortunately, in our country, they don't exist. So for all the other countries, yeah, absolutely. But in our country, not an issue. Um, so this weakens the, um, the provision. But as you can imagine, the most important um, a part of this provision um, is in accordance with international human rights standards. So it is not in accordance with national law. It is not, you know, juridical um, practices and um, systems are not, according to this, are not subject to national law not even to the Constitution. They are subject to international law, so they are subject to um, provisions that may exist in the Constitution, but they, they're definitely in international treaties, but they're not subject to provisions that do not exist in international human rights and, and states have um, added in their constitutions. And, and this, is quite, this has been quite controversial, and it took us a while to get this um, accepted and recognized. Um, Australia, sorry, <laughs> for example, argued in the General Assembly that, quote, the declaration places indigenous customary law in a superior position to national law. Australia will read the whole declaration in accordance with domestic laws and international human rights standards. So basically, Australia interpreted this provision to say something completely different. So um, this is wrong, uh, and it's not just Australia. Australia had the guts to say it. You know, a lot of states, you know, this is what they've been doing, and this is what they were um, implying during the elaboration and after the adoption so of the declaration. Um, and, and a lot of, um, and of course, this doesn't make sense. That's why we have international law. You know, we don't have international law um, as far as our national law kind of accepts it. Uh, international law is supposed to go further as, as long as states have accepted the, um, the, the specific um, provisions. International law is supposed to go further than national law and states have to accept and conform to it. And one could say that, okay, but the Russian Federation, for example, has said fine, but we never fully accepted the, uh, the declaration. We just abstained. We just remained neutral. And it's not legally binding, so we're just not going to um, um, follow this provision. The response to this is that, indeed, it's not legally binding, but the declaration can be said, can be used as an interpretative tool for Article 27 of the ICCPR. Um, so, Article 27 of ICPR, to remind you, says that uh, in states where they exist, uh, members of the minorities have the right to um, 
uh, follow their culture and um, have respect for languages and religion. Uh, have respect for their, enjoy respect of their culture and their religion. So, so the declaration, this, this provision, even though it's not legally binding, um, should be used as, an, as a way to interpret Article 27. So in a way, um, especially since um, uh, no state anymore disagrees with the declaration, um, I will remind you that Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and um, uh, and the U.S. have um, um, come around and have now endorsed the declaration. So, since no state has specifically disagreed with this provision, um, I think that this provision should be seen as an interpretive tool of Article 27, and in this way, it becomes uh, binding. Um, for um, for states. Um, so indigenous customs and structures include um, circle sentencing and indigenous sentencing courts, community-based structures and bodies, especially community-based family violence programs, mentoring and policing programs, as well as community-based alternatives to prisons. Um, these are some of the customs and some of the structures. Um, that are included in Article 34. Um, and, and again, let me just say um, again how important this provision is because um, um, although theory and practice worldwide, worldwide has accepted um, judicial pluralism, uh, when it came to international law, we didn't have a specific provision that would, um, um, a, a specific well-known and, and well-accepted provision that would um, um, expressly talk about um, subnational juridical systems. So in this respect, you know, this is a very important uh, provision. And, and I say that we don't have um, other instruments, and, but, but we do, and that's why in international human rights law, and, and that's why I made, I said, uh, you know, generally accepted and well known. Um, and ILO um, convention number uh, 107 and to a less degree ILO convention number 169 have been uh, widely um, ha have been treated unfairly by international lawyers and indigenous peoples themselves. ILO um, convention 107 on indigenous populations on the rights of indigenous populations was um, adopted in 1957 and yes it's very um, it's a simulationist, really. It, it adopts a very uh, highly integrationist uh, language, and, and it views indigenous peoples as um, groups that are going to vanish at some stage, but let's not kill them. You know, let's just let them kind of get assimilated. So in this respect, you know, people don't, don't like to talk about this convention very often. However, we still have 18 states that are bound by this convention, and also, the, although the language is very, um, is a relic of different times, the way it is interpreted by the Committee of Experts of the ILO is very progressive and in tune with the declaration and ILO 169. So in this respect, we have to um, um, discuss um, ILO 107. Um, and it says that, it reads that indigenous peoples um, are allowed to retain their own customs and institutions while these are not incompatible with the national legal system. So, unfortunately, we have the compatibility with uh, the national system. Um, and the same, but in a lesser degree, we have in ILO 169. ILO 169 was adopted in 1989. There are about, I think, 24 states who have um, um, signed and ratified this convention. Um, but because it was adopted without the active participation of indigenous peoples themselves, uh, it is not viewed as, um, in, indigenous uh, peoples are very reluctant to, to use it, which is a pity because it has some, some really great provisions. So um, ILO 169 discusses and, and uh, recognizes the integrity of the values, practices, and institutions of indigenous peoples and uh, says that they have to be respected and due regard is to be given to the customs or customary laws of indigenous peoples when applying national laws and regulations. But, again, um, the convention says that these 
customs and laws have to be compatible with national legislation and the international human rights standard. But in an expression of judicial activism, well, of semi-judicial um, activism, monitoring activism, the, the Committee of Experts has specifically said that the language um, should be interpreted as um, putting together national laws and international uh, human rights standards. So indigenous, um, indigenous customary systems and laws are only to be restricted if they are against both national uh, laws and international human rights standards. So if the constitution and the human rights um, treaties um, say uh, otherwise, not if only the constitution says otherwise. I'm very aware that I'm talking to constitutional lawyers. Um, so let's just move to some of the challenges um, that the declaration has um, um, has um, it gives to which the declaration gives some directions. So first of all, how do we identify customary laws? Um, what is the difference between customary laws and custom? Where are we going to have um, a, a, a how are we going to know that something is uh, a customary law and that's why indigenous peoples should have the right to maintain it and strengthen it and you know rather than a mere if you want custom um well there must be more than mere customs um they can be oral uh, customary laws can be oral or written codified or not they have to be viewed by the community as having binding effect rather than simply describing actual practices. So it has to be something more than mere description of practices. Um, they may concern different aspects of community life. So for example, especially for indigenous communities, natural resources, specific customary laws on natural resources, uh, cultural heritage are quite important. But at the same time, uh, one has to recognize that they're not static, but um, customary laws, indigenous customary laws, in the same way as other um, kind of state laws, evolve to the, and adapt to the social and economic changes, and their interpretation evolves and adapts. And some of them are formally recognized, but some of them are not formally recognized, because a lot of the, um, of indigenous, um, customs and practices are um, uh, not recognized by the state. And if we're talking about bilateral relations, so relations between equals in the way that um, Dias has interpreted self-determination, why should they be recognized by the state? A very important challenge for the declaration is to, um, and for indigenous rights, is the argument, the continuous argument of states that we cannot recognize um, group rights and we cannot recognize specific laws and indigenous laws and indigenous judicial systems because these may go, um, uh, this may discriminate these systems may discriminate um, uh, against specific sections of the indigenous population. So, for example, and, and this is something that comes up in the interpretation of, um, in the discussion of uh, UN bodies. So, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has expressed its concern for discrimination against indigenous children um, that touches all aspects of their lives, including cultural rights. And they have specifically said that customary laws and cultural practices have a detrimental, some customary laws, have a detrimental effect on indigenous children and especially girls. CEDAW, the Committee on the um, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, has also um, referred to some um, indigenous cultural practices that have a negative effect. The way the declaration deals with this issue is by emphasizing that this declaration is part of the whole human rights system. So, yes, we do recognize indigenous um, juridical systems, but 
this recognition is not absolute. Of course, there is going to be, when in conflict with other interests or other rights, of course, there's going to have to be a balancing um, exercise uh, and or uh, one right uh, will prevail over uh, another. Um, and Article 46.2 um, of FUNDRIP of the Declaration um, also confirms that this declaration, the, the provisions, including the provisions of customary um, laws and systems, have to be interpreted um, consistent with other human rights and values, and specifically mentions principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance, and good faith. Um, so, and, and we have the Lovelace case, which is uh, 1981. The Human Rights Committee has said that, um, of course, we're going to have conflicts of rights in international law. Otherwise, um, states and international organizations would not need international lawyers to find a solution um, and constitutional lawyers. But, um, but at the same time, there are some principles that guide all such conflicts. So the response is not, yeah, because probably there are going to be some conflicts, let's not recognize um, juridical, indigenous juridical systems. Uh, the response is, yes, let's recognize them. And when there are conflicts, let's try to find which right uh, will prevail um, at each case. Um, but one has also to keep in mind that the recognition of indigenous laws and systems does not endanger human rights any more than the recognition of non-indigenous and state laws and customs and systems. Um, so um, this has to be um, recognized. A third conflict, and I know, oh, um, a another issue that um, Jens said that uh, he would like to discuss us is um, who belongs to the group. So when it comes to uh, an expression of con possible conflicts, is this question who belongs to the group? And um, the human right, and uh, before the adoption of the declaration and the development since the adoption of the declaration, in international human rights law, there was this dominance, if you wish, of individual rights. So, you know, there was this, it was like axiomatic that if there is a conflict, almost, that if there was a conflict between in, uh, individual rights and, and collective rights, um, then individual rights would prevail. And since the declaration and other developments, um, this is not the case anymore. So, so the declaration article 9 says that indigenous peoples and individuals have the right themselves to belong to an indigenous community nation in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community. So they have the right to, um, to um, set the membership conditions. And this is very much the, the question at the moment in, um, um, in um, Sami lands, um, in, in Scandinavian countries, um, who, whether it is the state that is going to say who is a Sami or whether it is the Sami themselves that are going to determine who, um, who is a Sami. Um, and I think that everything I've said before um, also um, applies about conflicts of rights and, and balancing of um, different rights and, and different interests. So this, um, uh, another challenge is hierarchy of systems, who decide which court is responsible, and are indigenous decisions subject to the Supreme Court? The declaration has no specific answer to that. But I think I mentioned before that one has to look at self-determination and cultural autonomy, and one has to emphasize the difference between minorities and indigenous peoples. And it seems that if we interpret the declaration in the spirit of self-determination and the way self-determination is discussed and has been discussed towards the adoption of this instrument, it seems that um, indigenous decisions uh, may not be uh, subject to the constitution, but may be subject to human rights. Can the Supreme Court apply international human rights rather than its own domestic constitution? So we do have a, um, a difficulty here. 
and, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from constitutional lawyers on this. And finally, very quickly, the capacity of the indigenous peoples. The UN Special Rapporteur um, said in 2013, significant efforts should be made to ensure that appropriate mechanisms are in place to guarantee access to justice for indigenous peoples. This necessitates a combination of training on indigenous peoples' rights and customary laws for the judiciary and legal profession, consideration and consultation with indigenous peoples of how customary law and national law interfere, and the role of indigenous judicial systems should play in addressing rights and violations um, and conflict resolution. What is really, so, you know, we should have more indigenous judges, we should have more indigenous experts, the court should make more use of indigenous experts. It's no good to have a national judge interpreting what the land um, uh, indigenous customary law says um, and what the, um, um, the um, cultural um, indigenous systems are. We really need um, the actual leadership of indigenous groups themselves in, in these situations. Um, and, and I think this is very important, and, and what I haven't put in there mm. is that another thing that is very important and, and definitely should be raised is that the Declaration and development since the Declaration recognize the indigenous right to free, prior, and informed consent. So indigenous peoples should have not just participation, but should have a say that sometimes may even go as to a veto on matters that affect them. So on how national courts treat their um, legal systems and juridical systems. And I think that's very important because a lot of states, progressive states, say, yes, of course we're going to take into account what indigenous people say. But of course, there are going to be some groups of others. No. International law talks about free prior and informed consent. So indigenous should have the fair say. And finally, I didn't talk a lot about the non-discrimination, and I'm already way uh, beyond my time. But non-discrimination should also um, kind of run through any, um, any state um, um, justice systems when it comes to self when it comes to indigenous peoples. Um, and let me remind you what I said about the duality of the declaration. So um, the declaration says that there should be prohibition of discrimination, but also states should take active measures to ensure access, equal access of indigenous peoples to the national, um, to the state um, um, systems, judicial systems. Um, the, for example, language proceedings, um, Article 13.2 of the Declaration um, says very specifically that um, um, indigenous languages, um, the documents and judicial documents should be um, uh, also seen in, um, um, should be also produced in um, indigenous languages. I don't know how many states do that. <laughs> uh, oh, good. Um, and also access to justice in remote areas. Last night somebody um, said about uh, uh, video links um, uh, for uh, indigenous uh, remote areas, so that's fantastic. Um, er eradication of discrimination of police, legislator, and judiciary. So, for example, um, this can be seen, um, there is a very interesting example of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, Although the, the act it was very positive, the way it was interpreted by the judiciary weakened the actual protection for indigenous people. So the judiciary has to you know, be aware um, of, of um, um, indigenous matters. Um, and, and this is equally important. And thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, introductory presentation, which was actually much more than an uh, introduction and uh, set the frame, uh, touching upon many issues. The treaty issue, I think, is very important. We will see this now also with Australia and, and New Zealand in different ways, as we have seen with North, in North America with Canada and the U.S. The issue, I think, very 
central of bilateral relations, uh, the question of, of standards, and uh, especially what you touched upon uh, in the last part, and probably this is uh, the central part of what we will discuss uh, in, in these two days, is actually the question of relationship with the state and the state judiciary. And um, so I uh, might open the, the floor for some questions, comments on, on the presentation, let's say 10 to 15 minutes. Is there anybody who wants to? Please, Laura. Oh, thank you for such a. Yeah, you have to use the microphone because we have to give the people who are looking us in streaming the chance to sure. also listen. Sure. Not only to look. Thank you. Thanks for such a wonderful presentation. Um, my question was about Article 34, and so in accordance with human rights standards. What happens if we had a situation where the domestic um, human rights standards exceeded the international obligations and that customary law might have um, come into sort of conflict with the domestic human rights standards? Um, for instance, I'm thinking of South Africa and often the cases that you get when gender equality comes up against um, customary law practices and you could maybe say that um, the South African interpretation of the gender equality provisions might exceed um, what has been set out at the international standard. So how would Article 34 therefore deal with that in an interpretive framework? Yeah, uh, maybe we can collect two questions and then... Thank you for me also for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation, um, and I know relatively little about the declaration, so I'm now feeling much better informed. But I was thinking at the beginning of your presentation, um, I mean, the declaration's most impressive, but what's actually going on on the ground? Uh, and I wondered to what extent um, the international um, community or that part of the UN actually monitors uh, compliance. And I take into account all your points about uh, it's not a convention, it's a declaration, uh, but, but nevertheless it has, uh, uh, at least at the international level, some political punch. Um, and then as you moved on to make that point uh, on which you sought um, comment about whether um, there was any uh, recourse to the Supreme Court applying national constitutional law as opposed to international law, um, the question occurred to me again, and I thought, you know, even if you take even an enlightened constitution like the South African one, they would say this is a constitution complete in itself, and all law, including customary law, including indigenous law, uh, is comprehended by the standards of this constitution, and I assume also the institutions of this, insti of this constitution applying uh, national constitutional norms. Now, the... The position might be softened a little bit just because the human rights standards are so high under the South African constitution, but nevertheless there's not much doubt that they're applying national law, even if that's to some extent informed by international law. One question more, and then we'll take a second round question. I think somewhat related, <clears throat> but thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, so. Uh, so again, I'm also very interested in the relationship of, of the domestic uh, legal systems uh, to uh, indigenous, to the international, and I wondered whether, and then maybe this may also be in the South African context too, uh, whether how one uh, deals with um, issues, say, uh, uh, like um, intellectual property. And I'm thinking of uh, these ideas involved with uh, Ethnicity Inc. Um, the, the the use proposed use of 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 uh, national courts on behalf of indigenous rights um, and and it just just that interplay of the indigenous community and and those national courts and an attempt to use uh, traditional concepts to further the rights of of, of the property rights, the, in, the intellectual property rights of the indigenous population. Um, I think maybe in South Africa that comes up too. Actually, you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, 
several states have uh, taken specific test, um, specific uh, steps to endorse the, um, sorry, to create laws that are consistent um, to the declaration. So, for example, I think it's in Peru um, where they have passed a law, um, no, sorry, Bolivia. Bolivia, where they have passed a law um, that is just uh, the text of the declaration. Um, in Japan, with the Eno indigenous people, there, have been, um, there has been progress where the state has actually um, taken some steps for the recognition of, um, uh, of indigenous rights. So I'm not so sure that um, we should um, say that implementation has not been um, very successful. I think that, and, and not that you said that, but I think that um, I think that I I, <laughs> I was rather surprised to see how successful the implementation of the declaration has been. Um, also, the international, um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has been extremely, and and I was uh, tempted to talk about uh, the case law of the Inter-American Court but um, uh, it was not part of my presentation, you know, has been extremely successful in, um, um, in, in uh, uh, implementing the, the declaration, so the spirit, at least, of the declaration. So, so one can see that at the international level, but also at the national level, uh, the Whaling Commission is another body, that international body, that has been International Whaling Commission, has been uh, very successful in... Um, um, in, in um, recognizing uh, that um, some of um, its practices should be in accordance to the declaration. So at the international level and at the domestic level, you know, things are happening. Um, when it comes to, um, and things are happening when it comes to indigenous uh, customary uh, systems as well. Um, you asked the question about, um, but, but of course they should continue and they should be uh, strengthened. You asked the question about what happens if the um, standards go beyond the international. And of course, all these are very difficult um, issues, and, and, and there is some very difficult balancing. But um, Anaya um, is, um, was the previous UN Special Rapporteur on, on indigenous issues. And he's the one who said that when we interpret cultural practices and when we find this balancing between maybe um, cultural practices and, um, and, and, and cultural um, judicial systems and other interests or other rights, um, the first say should be with the, um, with the indigenous group itself. So it should be the indigenous group that should um, discuss how these conflicts should be um, um, should be solved. And I guess if we talk about gender um, uh, equality, um, it should be the indigenous women themselves. And very interestingly, indigenous women, especially indigenous women in um, the, the vocal indigenous women, for example, in um, North America, but also in Australia and New Zealand, have been very, have been very persistent in saying that um, gender issues should not be used as a way to weaken the, the declaration. So I know that probably I'm going to be the minority to the, uh, here, but I suspect that if a state and, um, has uh, standards that go beyond um, the international human rights standards, um, when in conflict with indigenous judicial systems, I would say that we should revert to the international human rights standards protection because we have two rights and we should find a way to accommodate both rights. So in this way, in, for these specific situations, I would say that we should revert to the international standards so restrict the um, gender equality in a way, um, in such a way that the indigenous customary systems 
are also accommodated. I'm not saying that we should completely forget about gender equality, so we have to keep that in mind. I'm not saying that you know, we completely forget. Uh, but otherwise, if we accept that, no, 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 the, the Constitution, if the Constitution goes beyond and the provision is good, the provision should just apply, forget about indigenous customary systems, then we make indigenous rights dependent on the national laws. And this is exactly what, uh, this is exactly the opposite of what the declaration says. Very, very briefly. No, no, sorry, just a second. Wait. I guess my question is just sort of once again thinking of the African situation, a South African situation, is that it's African women who are challenging and trying to use the constitutional protection, say, in inheritance rights cases and whatnot. And sort of the argument would be that this is indigenous, you know, it's African women who are part of the customary law but have never been part of form the formation of a very patriarchal legal system. So when the consultation happens sort of within the customary structures, that the women's voices are never actually heard. And so their only way to sort of, um, I guess, sort of transform the customary system as well is through the domestic system that might offer okay, more protection. Okay, let's find ways to kind of include the voices of uh, indigenous women then. Yeah. I, I think, you know, this is, uh, of course, like Kim Lika has talked about, revisibility of of cultural practices in general and, and you know all cultural practices, minority state cultural practices, minority cultural practices, indigenous cultural practices and, and systems and laws have to be revisited. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, um, on, on this occasion you, let's find a way of, um, of um, empower uh, more indigenous women rather than say that um, yeah, but it's not going to happen, so that's why we're just going to... We can accept indigenous rights as long as they don't kind of interfere with our vision of how um, society should evolve. I, I, I think that that would not be a very... I think this would be supported by international standards something like 10, 15 years ago, but since then we have, have had... And since the adoption of the declaration, we have had a lot of monitoring bodies and a lot of work that has been done on cultural diversity, interpretation of UNESCO instruments, um, um, uh, monitoring bodies that discuss. So this is what I meant when I talked about the end of the dominance of individual rights. Thanks. And, and again, we talk about um, the bit that goes beyond international human rights. Sorry, can I just ask, yeah. I, I, f I forgot to, um, so I was trying to find, um, there is a South African case and I was trying to find, um, to remember its um, uh, title um, that um, talked about, that specifically referred to um, the declaration. So the judiciary, the South African judiciary specifically referred to the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. So that's um, kind of um, very interesting in, uh, development. But also, um, when I was trying to find that in my computer, I came across, and maybe you know that more than I do, a new draft system, Protection, Promotion, Development and Management of Indigenous Knowledge Systems Bill 2014 of South Africa, in South Africa. And, and here we are in South Africa, a new bill, draft bill, that, um, that actually um, takes into account indigenous um, takes into account the, the what the declaration says in indigenous customary systems. So that's quite a good step forward. Hey, thank you. We, we have uh, four questions and then I would uh, afterwards continue with the presentation because as we have time for discussion after uh, the last presentation. So Marco Dani, Roberto Tognatti, uh, John Morrison and Alexander Trotskaya are the listed uh, thank you. I, I have a clarification question uh, because I'm a little bit puzzled. I found that there is a, a difference in the way you presented uh, the legal status of uh, uh, the declaration and the answer you just gave uh, uh, to the last question. So in the presentation, as I, if I understood well, 
you uh, put forward an idea that the declaration via Article 27 of the uh, International Convention on Civil Political Rights has more or less is more or less legal binding for member parties and uh, it should be simply complied with. Pacta sunt servanda, unconditioned status within member states, uh, member states and there cannot be some qualification in the light of national constitutions. In the reply you just gave, you more or less said that there can be some balancing between uh, the provisions of the declaration and the provisions of national constitutions. So I would like to understand why. My sense is that probably there should be some qualification. There is a case for qualifying the primacy of the declaration for the following reason. Because indigenous people do not live uh, in a secluded enclave. They come increasingly in interaction with other individuals who do not belong, for instance, uh, to uh, those uh, uh, groups. And as far as they interact, there is a case that in litigation between private individuals, this individual can also claim profoundly, justly, I think, their own constitution. The, the national constitution. And so there must be some way of balancing the competing claims between them. I'd like okay. to hear your view on this point. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Um, that All the points are very interesting and very difficult to answer. Um, so thank you for these questions. Okay, I didn't say, or I, I probably wasn't clear, I didn't say that then we should um, use the declaration as a treaty provision. Um, in actual um, truth, I am in constant disagreement with uh, Sigrid Wiesner and, and uh, Anaya on the customary international law status of the declaration and the binding force of the declaration. Claire Charters actually has been present in kind of us, um, me and, and Sigrid Wiesner kind of um, playing ping pong on, on this question. What I did say is that the declaration can be used as an interpretative tool of, the, of Article 27. And I don't see that there is, I don't, I don't see that we disagree here. What, what I'm trying to say is that generally the, we shouldn't always, you know, there should be a balancing act and, and also in some cases some rights prevail over other rights. And this happens in constitutions so economic development vis-a-vis -vis, um, individual right to property, um, trying a balancing act. If not, you know, one prevails over the other, but we make sure that the core of both are, uh, is maintained. So in the same way, sorry, in the same way, I, I guess this should, um, um, this should occur with, with uh, indigenous rights. Um, this, the, the possibility of um, violations of individual human rights has been used for more than 20 years and is still used by states to deny indigenous peoples the rights or to deny and now I can see that it's been used to deny what has already happened um, by states so I think that this is what I'm, I'm trying to um, um, I'm trying to oppose to. But it's also very interesting the way the, your logic, the steps you, you took um, in your uh, second part of your presentation on, on um, kind of trying to balancing the rights. But balancing rights Just does not mean that me. individual rights or state rights and interests should always prevail. And when it comes, sorry, and when it comes to third parties, because this is very, um, very topical, it's very often that the judiciary says, yes, of course, we recognize indigenous rights to the land and indigenous um, um, customary systems um, related to land. Um, but these are, um, uh, but, but we have to, unfortunately, we have to um, um, protect the rights of others. Um, for example, this has happened in New Zealand. Or we have to protect the economic development of the state. So that's it, you know, on this occasion, we did the balancing, and we forget about <laughs> indigenous rights, and we just focus on the economic development of the land or of the rights of third parties. And we also always have to keep in mind that indigenous peoples are the vulnerable, indigenous peoples are the ones whose rights have been violated, 
for a long time. So really, in my mind, often, usually, they should take priority over the non-Indigenous third parties. This is why the declaration was adopted, special protection. This is the whole thing. You know, international law recognizes that these people should have better protection, more protection than non-Indigenous um, individuals and, and groups. Uh, thank you. I join the general praise, of course, for your uh, very interesting presentation. But I, I would like to, to come back to this point. So my uh, question is very much in line with, with the one that Marco just uh, put. And it has to do with, I would say, one of the very first statements in your presentation uh, that is about duality. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem, I think, that duality may be part of a written legal text, but duality is never part of reality because there are always interactions, there are always a sort of melange, and uh, uh, to say it very bluntly, there is always an interest of individuals of cherry-picking whatever kind of legal system better suits their interest, and which I think is inevitable. So from this point of view, I'm afraid that, although I totally share, let's say, the spirit, the intuition of the declaration, as, if I may, often happens with instruments of international law. Uh, they give hopes, they raise expectations, but they always fail to, 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 to go to, to, uh, to the bone. In other words, the issue that has been raised by Marco, and I would add uh, in line with the gender issue that has been raised, what about the uh, trend of, of, of individuals towards emancipation? And the gender issues in South Africa are incredible. There is a very in interesting case, for instance, about the Constitutional Court acknowledging, let's say, a political decision to change a custom. And the political decision was by the, tr by the group itself. This is a case in which a lady was wanted to be, perhaps you, you remember the name of the case, Pontiyama or something like that. Uh, the, the, the daughter of a king wanted to become uh, head of the tribe. Uh, a cousin had the legitimate interest according to the customary rules, but they say, well, the Constitution says that it is non-sexist, so I have a right. And they went all the way up to the Constitutional Court and they said, yes, traditions are not static. If uh, a group decides to change a custom in order to put it in line with the Constitution, then we should welcome that. So, once again, one of the reasons why I appreciate so much your, your uh, presentation is that it does emphasize the ultimate role of courts. So the big problem is how to organize a judicial system in, uh, uh, in a legal environment in which, for instance, the declaration uh, needs to be enforced. And here we have different examples, the two, I would say, uh, Two cases from, from Latin America are very interesting. One is the case of Bolivia that you mentioned, where three members of the Constitutional Court, which is called Plurinational Court of Co Plurinational Constitutional Court, are elected by indigenous peoples and must have knowledge about indigenous law. And so this would be sort of melting together different, not uh, sources of law, but different systems of law juridical system, as Article uh, 29 says. Or the case of Colombia, where for the last, where all this has been put into the Constitution with great generosity, I would say, uh, but they have chosen a method of negotiation between the, the organizations of the indigenous peoples and state authorities in order to find out how to share the work. But after years of negotiation, they haven't gone any farther. So this is really a very crucial issue. And I'm afraid, and this is my question, I'm afraid that the declaration doesn't help in trying to provide an answer to the problem of uh, ensuring effectiveness of rights, but also of the, uh, of the interaction among the different systems of law. If I may abuse of my position as a, speak, uh, as a chair, just for clarification, you mentioned the... the main quarter, so you can. 
Yes, I, I have this special just double justification. So uh, the United, you mentioned the United Special uh, Nations Special Rapporteur in 2013 asking for more indigenous judges and experts. And this, I think, fits with, with uh, Roberto's question. So was he actually specifically advocating uh, to introduce more indigenous stuff into national courts? Because this would also be, again, the play with integration and separation. So there is the fiction of separation, duality, and there is the call for integration in, in terms of reflecting in, within the judiciary. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you all. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I uh, need to reflect, obviously, uh, your point and Marco's point and your point more. But let me just say, um, and all your points more, but uh, let me just say um, what comes to my mind. International law is not supposed to give answers. International law, constitutional law is supposed to give answers. International law is supposed to give directions. <laughs> so that's it. You know, that's the easy way out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, it's very interesting that I, I, I submitted a, um, a, a book proposal to um, a, a publisher uh, for another book and um, for a monograph, and the publisher came back saying to me, but what do you mean by directions? What, what do you mean by the fact that international law gives directions? What does directions mean? So I'm going to leave it there. Right, so if women's rights are violated, just trying to make myself clear, if women's rights are violated, let's, women's rights should prevail. So if women's rights are violated by indigenous systems, women's rights should prevail. But who is going to decide whether a specific judicial, indigenous judicial system violates women's rights. The non-indigenous judge, based on what? His middle class, um, Western educated background, the values of Western liberal democracies um, that obviously kind of promote indigenous rights, um, sorry, obviously promote individual rights. Um, so, so this is what I'm trying to answer, and this is what I'm trying to see how the declaration answers. Um, so I think that this is the one thing. The second thing, indigenous judges. Let's get more indigenous judges in the. Um, let's get more indigenous judges in the in the judiciary. Okay, on which criteria? Should they have finished and graduated from um, uh, um, from um, state universities? Should they um, know the state laws? Should they apply the state laws? Should they apply the state principles, the state values? Or should they have been educated on indigenous law? Should they apply the priorities and the principles that of the indigenous group? Um, and, and should they take into account the indigenous judicial systems? Should they sit with the state courts? Why should they sit, sit with the state courts? If we're talking about bilateral kind of relations on an equal basis, they should not. Why should they become subject to kind of the state courts? So this is what I'm, I'm trying to say. But if we all agree that, and, and there are practices and there are systems, indigenous, may I also say non-indigenous as well, that violate women's rights, absolutely. Indeed, um, women's rights should prevail. But who's going to decide whether this practice violates women's rights? Is it going to be the Western judge or the indigenous judge? Okay, we have two more. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. then we, uh, um, Alexandra, please, and afterwards John, so, because the microphone is already there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, let me uh, to add uh, some extra dimension, uh, which is about uh, religion foundations uh, of uh, indigenous people judicial system. Uh, I mean, uh, just a little example about the Russian Federation. Uh, maybe you have heard about Chechnya Republic, uh, which is uh, on the Caucasus. And, uh, uh, there was an idea to make Sharia courts in this republic. Fortunately, they hadn't succeeded right now. But uh, and of course, Chechnya is not ind indigenous people. But imagine that uh, judicial system of indigenous people uh, has 
religion foundations. And uh, what will do the Supreme Courts and the other uh, instances of the state with, uh, with it if uh, the state has to be neutral in the religious question? And uh, is it possible to balance uh, somehow these questions with these instruments? Okay. Just for the sake of um, uh, to be quick, um, I believe that the state is never neutral. And, um, you know, kind of, yes, it's, it's terrible that, um, that um, um, kind of um, Sharia law uh, may be applied, but uh, the state is not, not neutral. And um, um, this is something that we have to acknowledge in order to move forward. Very quickly. <laughs> okay, uh, an interesting paper which has produced some interesting discussion, and I hate to lower the tone with, with a very naive question. In a way, it's been covered already, but I'm going to come at you from a, a, a different way. Okay, is that better? Yeah, better, much better. Um, what's this declaration for, is my question. Why? It's a bit like, like Cheryl's question about enforceability in a sense. It, seems, it always seems to me when I look at international um, declarations, international human rights instruments, it's like a species of, sort of stamp collecting or train spotting or something. It's about identifying different areas. But I don't, I don't really ever get a sense of what the purpose of them is other than that kind of recognition function. I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm wondering, do, do, do states even know that these things exist? When I say states, I mean um, not high-level states, uh, you know, government level, but do police officers, social workers, teachers, even lawyers know that these things exist? Do they have any purchase in the real world? I'm only asking this question of Alexandra because we're old friends. I wouldn't dare ask anybody else <laughs> uh, such a naive question, but I hope she'd be able to help me out a little bit in this context, because it seems to me to, in a way, go to the whole, whole root of the whole issue of, of why, basically. Um, the declaration is is, uh, um, is a very high topic in um, several states, and um, I'm sure that we'll hear more about um, kind of specific measures that Australia has taken and, and is taking, and New Zealand um, kind of has taken. And the declaration has made an impact, um, as I mentioned, in, in several domestic um, cases. So the South African case, there is another one in Suriname case, um, there is another one, I think, the, um, in the um, Nordic countries. So, you know, the, the judiciary does know about the standards. Um, also, the declaration has made an impact on international, um, uh, at the international level. The Inter-American Court has talked a lot about the declaration in its judgments. Um, the African Commission on um, Peoples and Human Rights has talked a lot about... Um, um, about, uh, has talked in a case, in two cases actually, has referred to the declaration. So, um, who is it for? Um, uh, I think that uh, generally declarations are there as uh, stamp collecting, which I thought was brilliant and I'll use it. Um, but I think that this declaration, to a very large degree, because of the persistence of the transnational indigenous movement, which is amazingly powerful and, and kind of strong and, and focused, um, it, it is very well known. What is it there for? It is there to reverse the historical injustices and the current injustices that are committed against indigenous peoples. And is it, does it deliver? Well, I've just told you that, you, you know, the degree to which it delivers. Um, having said that, yes, you know, I just mentioned four states. I could mention about 10 states in the world. There are about 200 states. So I take your point. Hey, thank you very much. So I, I close the discussion here, and um, I think we have touched upon uh, very important um, and fundamental issues. And as a premium, as a reward, we will anticipate the coffee break. This is the good news, because I think this is much better now after this uh, introductory uh, overview part uh, to have a brief interruption and afterwards dedicate us to the two cases, uh, which also in some way uh, belong together. But what I give with one hand, as it is usual, I take with the other. So the coffee break will only last for a quarter of an hour sharp, yeah? so that we have really time to continue to discuss. And, and this is your own fault, because as we have already discussed uh, a lot now, we will uh, absolutely, uh, we are forced to continue like this. So see you at 11.20 uh, here, please. <laughs>